Hey everyone, this is an Amalgia video for Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered Edition. And today we're going to be talking about Konal Karak, Cycle 1. The Swamp Zone is also where you get the Cure Ring and the Life Ring. To get there, you'll need to cross the Jegan River and head west to the Fields of Fum, Celebration Cave, and Damon's Court. If you're in a year where the river is still dry, you'll probably need to complete Veolu Sluice and fix the river in order to get there. You can also open the world map to check what elements each Miasma Stream is. The Miasma Stream west of the Fields of Fum often requires an element that you won't be able to get on the west side of the river, so you may need to check in advance, grab the element from the east side of the river before crossing over. Once you're through the Miasma Stream west of the Fields of Fum, and you're on the Rabenna Plains, Konal Kurok is located to the south. This dungeon's a long one, but it has some important artifacts in, so once you're geared up, head inside. Part of the reason that this dungeon is so tricky to full clear is because many of the enemies are hidden in swamp water or underground, and there are many winding maze-like paths. These Moo enemies aren't more difficult than other Moos, they're just a little bit faster. And this one to the southeast drops Cure Magicite. The third Moo here is to the north. To the left there will also be a rock that has some text on it, but you can only read it if you're a Selkie. To the east there are two ice bombs. They're immune to ice, but they can be stunned with thunder spells. Behind them in that southeastern corner is a treasure chest, so take them out and go grab it. Now we're heading northwest to bait Sahagins out of the swamp, but as you can see here the angles that they're willing to jump out at you on are a little tricky and picky. There are some ranged plant enemies up here, but instead of firing poison balls at you, they mostly cast magic spells and slow. With them defeated, we're heading north, and there will be some Sahagins that jump out of the swamp to block your path. The north path on the fork here is just a short dead end, and so you don't need to bother with it. Head west to continue on. The Ray's Magicite is going to be very important, as Holy is extremely useful in this level, especially in the later zones. This level is actually a little bit easier to handle solo than it is online. I'll mention some of the differences between solo and online play in this level as we move throughout, but one of the problems is that because many of the paths are narrow, characters get stuck behind one another trying to get in front to fight enemies. This path is winding, but it doesn't have any deviations, so just keep following it to get to the next part of the level. At the end of the narrow path, you'll wind up in a wide open space. There's no best way to cover this whole area, but you will need to zigzag throughout it in order to get all the monsters and treasure chests. I'm going to speed this section up, but just know that there's a treasure chest in the north part, in the center, in the south part, and the southwest. There are hidden Sahagins in the north, in the center puddles, and in the southern part. Some jump out of the puddles near the southern treasure chest, and others jump out from the water's edge. There should be a total of three Sahagans near that south chest. One comes out of that east water body, and I actually think I missed it in the video. So just run back and forth a bit if you think you've missed one. Lightning bombs are just like ice bombs, and when you destroy them, they may explode and stun you if you're in the blast radius. Once you've woven through this large area and tried to collect as many of the enemies as possible, the zone line is to the northwest. When you get on the second map, you're going to want to head left first because it's a dead end and we want to clear out all the enemies that are in that direction. There isn't a treasure chest over here though, so once you kill the two frog enemies up top, you're good to head back. There may also be some additional Sahagins that will jump out at you because they were waiting for you to head back south. Once you're back at the fork, head east. There will be some magical plant enemies and some Sahagans that pop out of the water, but there's going to be a fork that goes left and right. If you've already watched my video on Damon's Court, then you're aware that you needed to blow up the bridge in order to unlock a new area in Konal Kurok. The left path that we'll see at the fork is the new area that you can get to by blowing up that bridge twice. The large Sahagin up here has access to Blazara, but he's not actually as scary as his large physique makes him out to be. The real danger up here is that there are four Sahagins hidden underground. They're brown with red faces, and they're immune to all types of magic. If you accidentally run in too deep, you can have all five of them on you at the same time, and then the fight gets real. Any focus attacks you have that may inflict stun are very helpful for stunning the entire group in a single swing. These Sahagans also have more HP than the normal ones, so it's something to keep in mind when you're trying to burn them all down. 
Once they're defeated, head north and grab the treasure chest in the grass to get your reward. The Soul of the Lion was an item that was only available in Cycle 1 and 2 of Konal Kurok and was missable by the time you reached Cycle 3, so it's a good thing to have in your inventory just in case. Now we're heading back to the fork and taking the right path north. We've seen plank and log paths, but now we're about to come up on a type of path that looks almost like a raft floating on the water. In multiplayer, if too many people are standing on the raft at the same time, it will submerge you in swamp water, which will deal damage over time. At this fork, you want to head to the right, because it's a dead end with a treasure chest. There will be some plant enemies and some sahagins blocking the way, but they're pretty easy to deal with, so take them out. Once you have the treasure chest, just head back, and then we're going to take that left path to the north. There will be more flans and plant enemies, but when you reach the end of this path, there will be another frog enemy. They're pretty easy, except they have high HP, they're immune to ice, and their tongue attack can stun you. They also cast blizzard frequently. Beyond the frog enemy, the path forks in a number of different ways, but you're going to want to take this first path that leads south, because it leads to a long dead end with some treasure. After you have the treasure chest down here, there's also a Moogle Den right to the west of it behind that tree. It's a little hard to see, and it's a little difficult to target. This plank path to the south is a decoy, so once you have the treasure in the Moogle Den, you can just head back north to the fork. Now we're going to kill that flan and grab that treasure chest to the south. But then we're going to head north and ignore the east paths for now. When you hit this section up here with these two frog enemies, we're also going to ignore the eastern path and head north to the dead end. You will have a treasure chest and two sahagins. Once you have that treasure, head back to the fork and head east. There will be a treasure chest in the dead end to the east, but then we're going to head southwest to grab two more treasure chests that we missed when we went north. Once you have the two chests on the sides of the floating raft, we're going to head east, but then we're going to take a detour that cuts southwest. There are a few treasure chests down here, and it's also the most important detour in the entire dungeon. You used to not be able to get the Cure Ring out of Cycle 1 of Kono Kurok, but now you can. Not only can you get it off the boss, but it also can drop out of this chest at the end of this dead end. There are also some unique flying mantis enemies down here. They're susceptible to gravity, and they can be frozen with blizzard. But one of the reasons they're important is that sometimes they'll drop jagged scythes, which is a material that you need to craft some items, and it's hard to obtain. Keep heading around this bend to the east, and then it will curve north. The mantises can also cast curse, where if you get it on you, it looks like your character is almost smoking with a dark cloud. Curse increases your casting time, lowers your movement speed, but the worst part is that it halves your stats. The good news is, is that unless you're standing in it for example's sake, it takes them a long time to cast and you can usually have them dead by the time they get it off. This treasure chest up here is the one that I was talking about and contains the Ring of Cure sometimes. In Cycle 1, it's possible to get it out of this chest and the boss, so if this chest doesn't give you the Ring of Cure, you still have a chance to obtain it at the end. It's also possible to have two in the same artifact menu at the end after you beat the dungeon. After you have that chest and head all the way back, we're heading to the zone line to the east so we can enter the third and last part of Konal Kurok. The Sahagins in this area are immune to magic, so you have to take them out with physical attacks. There will also be large behemoths in this area, another reoccurring Final Fantasy enemy. They can use their tails to cast large circular blasts of magic on the ground. They can also stun you with their horns. Despite using all three elements, you can still freeze them in place with blizzard magic. So if you're playing online, Ice Spell Fusion is probably best, and if you're playing solo, just make sure to set Blizzard before you try to take him out. Now we're going to go up that wooden plank that leads northeast. At this point, if you're playing solo and you have enough command slots, you may want to keep Holy on all the time, because you're going to need it a lot. At this point, head left and grab that treasure chest. The whole path loops around anyway, so you don't really need to go to the right. There will be more magic immune Sahagans, so be ready with your physical attacks. When you reach this section here, there will be a Ghost Flan and a Sahagin. Just spam Holy on the Ghost Flan until he's dead and kill the Sahagin with physical attacks. Once they've both been defeated, head north. You can ignore that south path because that's the one that loops around and we've already been where it leads. Now at this first fork, deal with the ghosts and head left. There will be a treasure chest and another enemy at the dead end. After this short path is cleared out, head back and then head north and follow that path. Despite how winding this path looks, it doesn't have any other deviations, so follow it to its end and then we'll be in another wide open space. 
Up here, there's a behemoth and a magic casting plant enemy. Once they're dead, we're going to head out to the east and clear out that space because it's a large dead end. East past the first behemoth is another behemoth, another magical plant enemy, and a magic immune sahage. Some good news is that these behemoths can drop orichalcum on cycle 1, which means you can finally get some solid armor if you're still early in the game. The box up here also sometimes has eternal armor in it, which in the old game was a missable item if you were past cycle 1 and cycle 2. Now we're heading west to fight another behemoth and a ghost flan. Once these enemies are dead, we're heading to the southwest. There's a path there that's a dead end with a treasure chest. Once you have it, backtrack to the north, and we're going to fight another behemoth and some ghost flans. It's difficult to pull them away individually if you're having problems, but you can always run away and then let them return to their spawn point if you need. Once this group is dead, southeast of them, there's another treasure chest. Once you have the treasure, we're taking this plank bridge to the northeast, and we're finally in the last stretch of Konal Karak. This area mostly has ghost enemies, magic immune sahagans, and magic plant enemies. Kill both enemies at this fork and then head north. It doesn't really matter which way you choose here, but uh, heading north after you kill this plant enemy can save some time. Up here there's a magic immune sahagin, and to the east past him is another treasure chest. Once you have that treasure chest though, you're good to go to the boss. Make sure before you enter that you set holy because you're going to need it. If for some reason, offline or online, you don't have the ability to cast holy, you're in for the fight of your life. In cycle 1, this fight isn't too bad, but it still possesses a lot of danger. In addition to being immune to magic, these Sahagans have a long claw attack that can petrify you, so it's good to get rid of the adds as soon as you can. You'll also notice that the entire battle platform is very small and made up of four different log sections. If you're playing solo, this part of the battle doesn't matter, but if you're playing online, too many players standing on the same log section can submerge it, and that will deal more damage over time to you during this battle. The zombie dragon also has a sweeping poison breath that can add even more damage over time to this battle. Cure is a must, but clear is also helpful, especially if you're playing online. The zombie dragon also has a long-range beam attack that can petrify you, as well as the danger of the petrify from the Sahagin. This is one of those fights where magic really shines. A lot of times the zombie dragon will rotate between being in a backward stance where it's incredibly difficult to hit him with physical attacks and a forward stance where you can hit him with physical attacks but only at the tip of his head. I believe ranged focus attacks do still work though. The zombie dragon also has a whirlwind attack but it mostly just knocks you back. While it is possible to kill the zombie dragon outright, it has a lot of HP while its undead barrier is up. You want to hit it with holy, and then you want to hit it with the hardest hitting magic you have. After you land holy once, Fira works wonders for taking down its HP. The silver lining to this fight is that without its zombie protection, this boss has very low HP. Now let's talk about the artifacts. In cycle 1, I have only seen the cure ring. I have not yet seen the life ring, and I've run this dungeon on cycle 1 maybe 8 or 9 times. You used to have to have over like 315 bonus points in order to have access to the life ring. I doubt it's that high in the remastered edition. I think it's just been moved to cycle 2. If anyone's seen the life ring out of either a box or the boss in cycle 1, please let me know in the comments. I'm very interested. If you don't have a cure ring yet and it's in the artifact list, it, you should absolutely take it as it will make you a lot stronger and more useful online. Here's a screenshot of when I got two cure rings, so it is possible for you and a friend to both get one out of the exact same run, although the chances are low. If you found any of the Amalgia guides helpful, please subscribe. It really helps us out. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.